We're not going back. The five wives of the Morton are kind of just like the princesses of the post-apocalyptic world. We don't have disease, we're, we're healthy, we're given food and water, we're looked after. Each of the wives has a different relationship with the Immortan. Are they a breeding stock that are, ba are basically providing the Immortan with an heir? He's looking for a healthy male heir, like all monarchs and kings and most of history. They haven't experienced much else, but I think they know that the way that they're being treated in there isn't humane how they're living is pretty painful. It was just, it was really, really eye-opening for me, the, the reality of what it meant to be in that position, to be used as an object. It was really emotional. As horrible as it is, he's also like our father in, in I think he'd like to think that we adore and love him, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's quite the case. Part of signing on for the movie was on the condition that all five of us would agree to spending extensive time in rehearsal periods and workshopping, which uh, for me as a new actress was a really exciting, fulfilling period. The girls were supposed to be, as George would describe, like a five-headed hydra. That had to be reflected in the way they related to each other. They had to be this unit. Everything has to kind of come through our body language and our, you know, the looks in our eyes and these subtleties. And George wanted that all to be real. We were kind of supposed to have spent so much time together in a small space that we'd move like each other, we'd almost speak like each other, we'd finish each other's sentences. But each of the five wives are like their own musical note. They are different notes in a, in a little melody line in this, in this film. It became really clear through this period that this movie has this underlying feminist quality to it, and that's really the story that the girls are trying to tell. There's not much dialogue involved in this film, especially for the girls, so a lot of what we had to do was reacting to things that were going on around us. I spent a lot of time reading about women who had babies through being raped, and at times it was very hard, and I really wanted to honour that with, with Splendid, the conflict that she would feel. It was pretty intense stuff, and in the first month, we got to know each other way too well, <laughs> to the point where it was like, we were like sisters the rest of the time. <laughs> Which is good and bad. <laughs> I remember when I first got the call about Mad Max, and I had imagined that we would all be in leathers and have guns and have the whole like a chick uh, theme. But George explained that our costumes, at least these five women, were going to be in some form of Muslim and cotton and sheets, and that over the course of the film, we would sort of get more and more disheveled and naked. Our costumes or uh, lack of costumes. <laughs> Although it's simple, it's like white panties and a white bra, you know, that type of thing. But they, they're actually very detailed when you look at them and they all relate perfectly to our character. I have more of like a sort of, it's like this crisscrossy neck thing and I've got like braids and I look a little bit less perfect, I think, than maybe <laughs> Splendid and, and the other girls. I wanted my costume to be really, really simple. You know, the girls had like broad tops and things like that. Mine's like, a high, like kind of like just a shirt because I saw Toast as kind of a loner. A big part of my costume was my prosthetic belly, which for me, it was so important that it was real and it felt as real as possible. So the weight of the stomach is, it, it was pretty heavy and I would put it on every morning and, and uh, by lunchtime I'd have to be lying down and it was bizarre how familiar I became with it and it became a part of me. I'd sit there with my lunch balanced on top of it and <laughs> eating. We have to wear chastity belts. Oh, but um, the Morton puts them on us because we're his and only his, so he takes them off only when we're with him. They're quite gruesome. They've got, like, teeth. Ugh, I hated wearing it. <laughs> 
It was rather uncomfortable for, for all of us. It was very real. The costume was definitely a challenge. There were some brutal, brutal weather conditions we had to endure, especially the first three weeks of filming. We were in an environment at a, at a time of the year where it was very gray almost and incredibly cold. You can't feel that when you watch the movie. We had to be soaking wet out in the freezing cold. Action! We had to roll in the dirt to get our costumes dirty to start off with, and then they drenched us down. And camera up. There would be this horrific moment for all of the girls where we all begrudgingly had to shed our coats and our hot water bottles and blankets and start jumping around like freaks to try and... Uh, I mean, it must have been hilarious to have watched. And I had this belly on the whole time. <laughs> Roll down. And, and we were just freezing, absolutely freezing and miserable, but it meant we could use that in our characters. I'm glad that it was the beginning of the film because we were all still very... We had a lot of, like, enthusiasm and energy, and we just began. It was, it was fun. Character building. <laughs> This part of Namibia in particular is just very desolate. It's the desert. We'd be laying on the desert floor, and singing duets and kicking our legs in the air, like in, in some sort of strange hysteria. And then moments later, we were all like almost in tears, wanting to get the fuck out. There's this one scene with the Immortan where he drives past in the Giga Horse, and it was the first time that I had ever seen Hugh in character and in costume. They couldn't breathe. There's so much that goes on, and it's like your emotional state and your mental state is heightened because there's nothing around you. There's just, like, desert plains for miles and miles and miles. You kind of get plucked out of your world, and you all of a sudden you get dropped in the middle of the desert for six months, and that's all you have. And you kind of have to strip everything away and see kind of who you are. We all were very lonely, but we had to find comfort in each other and ourselves and in the story and in the desert and in George. And it was cool because it made it easier to understand this world, you know? The dust and the sand and the wind were pretty hard to work under. You'd be doing a scene and they're like, dust machine, and, they were, and you'd be struggle to keep your eyes open. Or they'd put a wind machine in when it, there was already a whole heap of natural wind and it was freezing and it just made it ten times colder. And cut. Cut in there. Back. Very good. There was times I'd come back from set and take a bath and drain the bath and it would just be <laughs> covered in sand and mud. Or I'd have to take six showers to get the sand out of my hair and ears and every hole possible. Sometimes I think that this whole thing was just like putting us in Spockland and working in the desert was just sort of a whole ploy to make us actually go insane, <laughs> which I think kind of worked a little bit. You know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm sleeping. We were shooting in the canyons. It was really hot and everybody was sort of having a long day and um, I wrapped and I was sort of w like walking around and it's like dead silent and we're in the middle of the desert and really hot. And then all of a sudden we start like in the distance hearing Bob Marley and we're all just like, what? and we're like looking around and all of a sudden like it gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And it's like this, this guy comes up on a bicycle, like pedaling through the canyon with Bob Marley, like boom box on his bike and starts like coming up and everyone started pissing themselves. And Tom had gotten a ice cream man to come for us in the middle of the desert. It's pretty funny. There'd be moments where we'd all be laughing and singing and mucking around. And, and that, was, that was great, I think. You know, the, the wonderful thing about working with an ensemble cast is that you build these relationships with people and, and you forge friendships and bonds. This definitely has changed me as a person. And I don't think that anybody can understand unless they were in Swaka <laughs> and, uh, and here doing this with us, because it was pretty intense for everybody, not not just us. There's so much more behind it for, you know, what everyone went through. Like, there's just like blood, sweat, and tears into this film, for real. 
we definitely shared a lot of a lot of good times and memories and laughs and all the opposite things to that too. <laughs> I think everything after this film will be will be almost too easy, you know. <laughs>